I'd like to give you what I think of as the great spiritual teachings of many various persuasions. There's a story that summarizes it. It's the story of what I call the four philanthropists in a village. The conquerors had come through and they had taken all of the men or many of the men who were warriors at the time and they had placed them into this prisoner of war camp right in the village and many of the villagers knew that their compatriots were imprisoned and the first philanthropist was a person who had great wealth and he went to the people who had the prison and were in charge of it and he said to them I understand the men are not able to have fresh water and cold water. I would like to donate all of my earnings and everything that I have to purifying the water for them and making sure that all of them will not be sick. And he was granted that. And he felt like he had fulfilled his destiny, that he had done what he was here for. The second philanthropist discovered that the men were sleeping on rocks and that they were cold at night, they didn't have blankets. And he took all of his funds and he said to them, I would like to provide bedding and blankets for the people so that they will be comfortable when they sleep at night. And he was granted that right and he donated his money for this purpose. And again, he felt that he was fulfilling his destiny. The third philanthropist discovered that the food that they were eating was inadequate, that they were just given uh, beans and, and, uh, and water and some bread. And so he said, I own a farm and I'd like to grow all of my food and I'd like to take this food to all of these prisoners. And he was granted that right. And all three of these great philanthropists in the village felt that they had really completed their mission for why they were here. But the fourth philanthropist was a saint. He was living not at ordinary human awareness, but at higher consciousness levels. And he went and he found out where the keys were. And he went to the prison at night and he released all of the prisoners. And this little metaphorical story really tells us that when we are living at ordinary human awareness, there's nothing wrong with those who are out there who can help us to suffer in comfort. All right. <laughs> and many of us have learned to do that and accept that and say, all right, as long as I'm comfortable, even if I'm suffering, it's okay. But there are those who have keys. And those keys can open the prisons. One of the great teachers in my life was Carlos Castaneda. And Castaneda talked about his teacher, who was what they call a Nagua, a, a Native American term that uh, refers to uh, all that is knowable. And... He, his teacher told him that your life is like being born into a, uh, a room, a mansion, if you will, that has a thousand rooms, but you're born into one room. And this one room is called daily human awareness. And the only way you can get in is through conception and birth. You're in. And the only way you can get out, we are taught, is to die. So we spend our lives in this mansion in one room, even though there's 999 other rooms. We don't know how to get out into those rooms unless we die. So we wait to die. And what his teacher told him is, I can teach you how to get out of the room of daily awareness and into the other 999 rooms. And if you stay with me and learn all that I have to give you, I can teach you how to get out of the house altogether without having to die. And what we have to do in order to get to that place where we can take the keys and unlock the self-imposed prisons or the prisons that we have given ourselves on the basis of what we have come to believe is our limitations, what we can and can't do. We have to let go of that. And I call it rewriting our agreement with reality. We literally have to make a, a, a whole new contract with what it is that I perceive to be what is possible for me. And in order to do that, we have to shift out of the things that we have come to believe in 
And everything that you came to this program watching tonight that you believe in was handed to you by someone else outside of you, was handed to you by the experiences or testimony of someone in the past. And because it comes from outside of you, there is still an element of doubt. And this element of doubt isn't bad, but it keeps you from reaching higher levels because what you think about is what expands. And if you're thinking doubt, then doubt is what expands. William Blake said, if the sun and moon should ever doubt, they would immediately go out. So how do we get past what we believe in or what has been handed to us and still honor it and be grateful for all of the teachers and all of the people who have come before us? So what we have to learn to do is let go of that tribal consciousness and shift to what I call a knowing. Now, there's a big difference between what you believe and what you know. Everything that you know is something that you have made conscious contact with. Conscious contact. So there's nobody out there watching. There's nobody in this world who knows how to swim, who learned it by somebody else telling them that you can swim. Or by watching Mark Spitz go through the water. <laughs> or by uh, observing other people doing it. You may remove some of the doubt, but you will never know how to swim until you get in the water and blub around a few times and then do it. And then you'll have a knowing. And that knowing is something that you'll never lose, just like riding a bicycle or dancing the Macarena or making a, a, a lemon meringue pie or anything that you know how to do. It's because you've made conscious contact. And I'd like to suggest that there's a big difference between knowing about a divine presence, knowing about a sacred awareness, knowing about God, and knowing God. There's a big difference. Just like there's a big difference between knowing about the possibility of being able to heal myself of something that is bothering me, perhaps a disease process. I perhaps may believe that it's possible because I've read other people and I've heard others say it. And I've read the testimony and I've listened to the tapes and I've gone to the seminars. But until you have made conscious contact with it, you'll never know it. And I'd like to suggest there are, there's a wonderful poem. I'd like to share this poem with you. It's uh, written by a wonderful woman. Her name is Valerie Cox. And she lives up in Seattle and she's written quite a bit of poetry. This particular poem really speaks to me to the difference between what you know and what you believe in. Immerse yourself in, this, in these words. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She munched cookies and watched the clock as this gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. And when only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat, then sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. I love that. I love that. If mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one the ingrate, the thief, the cookie thief. And all of us in some ways are cookie thieves. I have eight beautiful children. 
our youngest little girls, eight years old. One of the things that you do when you become enlightened and become a guru, like me, <laughs> that'll be the day, <laughs> is when we place something that is important to know where it is, we practice mindfulness so that we never misplace anything. So obviously, having reached this exalted level of awareness in my home with my eight children, I never misplace anything. So I place my keys right here in a certain spot. But my little girl has this wonderful habit of taking my keys and hiding them on daddy in the morning so that she can watch me flip out <laughs> as I look for the keys. And I'll say, Sage, how many times has daddy told you don't hide my keys in the morning? Daddy, you told me not to do it. I don't hide your keys anymore. Come on. Where did you put my keys? The last time they were in your dollhouse. Where did you put them? Daddy, you told me not to do it. And then, of course, my 12-year-old daughter, Serena, loves to just assume this stance. <laughs> She's watching me raise my voice. She'll say, I wonder what all those people would think of Mr. Positive if they could see him right now. Huh? <laughs> Get lots of reminders. <laughs> So I give up. I say, look, when I come back out here, I want those keys here. And I go back and I get my clothes on and I reach in my back pocket. And there are my keys. Right where I had left them the night before, in my pocket. And there's a fine line, I think, between being a guru and being a jerk. All right? <laughs> and I've probably crossed that line more times than I should be admitting here on television. But this idea of being a cookie thief and creating a knowing, a knowing is something... I did a benefit, uh, along with my wife, a couple of uh, years ago with a man uh, on Maui, uh, whose name is Michael Kanaf, who had been uh, injured uh, in, a, uh, in an accident. He, he's a, a quadriplegic or paraplegic. And at that meeting, when it was over, there was a, a man who lived on another one of the islands who was known as a kahuna, a healer, an ancient healer from Polynesia. And he was introduced to me, and he said, that was a nice talk, and so on. And I said, um, how do you get to be a kahuna? You know, do you, do you take kahuna 101? I mean, uh, what courses do you take? How, what, how does this work out? And he said, no. He said, uh, kahunas are raised to have no doubt. To have no doubt. To have a knowing. And he said, when a, when a knowing confronts a belief in a disease process, the knowing will always triumph. And that knowing is something in which you say, you are healed. And healing takes place. One of the great stories of knowing is, again, with our little girl, Sage, who uh, we were uh, spending the summer uh, in, in our summer home, and we went to visit uh, this uh, dermatologist. And Sage has had this thing called flat warts for the last, uh, well, since she was two and a half years old. From two and a half until seven, which is over four years, she had these flat warts. And not only did she have them around her face, around her uh, mouth and around her nose, but they were getting worse. They were moving up and they were getting up around her eyes and so on. And we noticed that, that they were getting progressively worse, even though all of the places that we had taken her had said, they will go away. She'll outgrow them. But it didn't seem to be that way. And they always said it would be a few months. Well, years had gone by and she still hadn't. So we were over at my friend's, uh, this dermatologist on, uh, in Kihei, and he... Um, I said, uh, Kenny, as long as we're here, would you mind taking a look at, uh, at Sage? And my wife was there, and he took these big white light, and he put it in her face, and he said, uh, you've got flat warts. She hates that term. She never wanted to call them flat warts. She calls them her bumps. All right? She just called them her bumps. So um, he said to her, but the good news is that when you get married, you won't have them. Well, she's seven and a half, going, oh, who's this dork you've got me talking to now? <laughs> and then he said to her something. He said, you know, we can't burn them off, and there's no medicine that we can give them. But he did say something to the effect that the ability to rid yourself of these things is within yourself. And that if you can call upon that healing capacity in you and begin to talk to these bumps in a way in which you ask them to leave, that you have a much greater chance of getting rid of them faster than anything that I could give you, and we certainly can't burn them off because we might scar your pretty face. And that's basically the message that he gave us. I'm paraphrasing it. 
So we went back that night to where we were staying, and there was a whole bunch of kids there, as there always are when, uh, when we're staying, and all of their friends were there. And we walked into the bedroom, and it was late at night, and over in the corner, in a, uh, on her air mattress, was Sage. And she had the blankets pulled up over her head, and she had a flashlight underneath the blankets. And I went over and I lifted up the blanket. I said, honey, is, is everything all right? She said, shh, I'm talking to my bumps. And I left the room and I came into my wife who was in the other bedroom. I said, honey, you're not going to believe this, but Sage is in there talking to her bumps. Isn't that great? The next night we did the same thing. That was the second night. The third night, the same thing. Now that was third, on Friday. This happened on Monday. On Friday, as God is my witness, on television, every single one of those bumps was gone and has never reappeared since. A knowing. You see, there is a stream of healing that is something that we can plug into. It's very much like electricity. People say, well, in ancient Greece, there was no electricity. There was electricity. We just didn't plug into it. That's all. And there's a stream of healing. And when we go into that stream of healing with a knowing, we go to a higher level within ourselves. And we don't allow any doubt in. Basically, in every single one of us, every human being out there, there are two of us. There's two people. The first person in each uh, person is called the ego, or I call it the ego. E-G-O. Earth guide only. All right? This is the part of us that says who I am is separate from you, separate from God, separate from my environment, and therefore I'm in competition with, and my value is based upon how much I get, how much my stuff is worth, how much better looking I might be, or how much more uh, attractive I might be, how much more money I might have, the value of my possessions, and so on. What is mine? So it's not mystical awareness which says I am connected, it is that individual lower level of awareness which says my ego, this is mine. Also in each and every one of us there's another person. And this other person is called what I call the sacred self or the higher self. And this sacred or higher self really doesn't care how much you get. It doesn't care who you're better than. It doesn't care how much stuff you have. It's not interested in any of that. The problem is that we very seldom listen to it. We pay very little attention to it. This higher or sacred part of us wants only one thing. It wants us to be at peace. At peace. Whatever choice you make in every interaction you have, make the choice to be at peace, your sacred or higher self says. Whereas your ego says, oh, no, 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 no. It's much more important to be right. And so we find people in relationships struggling, struggling a lot. And one of the things that they struggle about is who's right and who's wrong. Most of the fights that you have in your relationships really basically, when you, it's oftentimes you forget the details. But it's basically about who's right and who's wrong. So that if you want to have your higher or your sacred part of you ruling in your life, I suggest this to you. Practice being kind rather than right. When you have the choice, and you have the choice in your relationships with your spouse and your ex-spouse, with your parents, with your grandparents, with your in-laws, with strangers on the freeway, with flight attendants, with waiters, with whomever you interact, if you can just subdue this ego part of you which says, it's important for me to be right, which will introduce you to stress and anxiety and fear and so much of the stuff that I talked about earlier, and instead say, how can I suspend this part of me and allow the, allow the part of me that wants to be at peace, that wants to be happy, that wants to be fulfilled? And if I said to you, I'm going to give you a magic wand, and with this magic wand, I am going to allow you to just wave it and get anything that you want, whatever you want. You can have this, you can have this car, you can have this these uh, nice clothes over here, you can have this home, whatever it is. Or I said to you, in lieu of that, I'm going to give you another wand, and you can wave this, and for every moment for the rest of your life, you'll be at peace. Whatever comes along, you'll be able to choose peace. And basically, we know that we're only here for a very short time. And being able to choose peace, which is what the sacred part of you begs you, the higher self, once you get that, 
You begin to shift away and you stop telling yourself that the people who are close to me in relationship with me are the people who don't belong there.